Right, boys and girls, we're going to be talking about symmetric encryption today. Um, I've got a few people in here that are going to ask me questions, hopefully throughout the stream, to clarify things. But we're going to be sort of delving in from hashing that we were speaking about previously and into symmetric encryption, followed by, at some point in the future, asymmetric encryption. So, let's dive right in. It's called symmetric. Well, actually, let's, let's try and think of a really good way of doing this. Back in the very historical Roman times, and probably even when people were sort of like young and uh, when you were kids, you most likely wrote the alphabet down. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. It's actually more letters than I remember. Um... And what people sort of used to do is when you were in class or when you were just messing around with your friends, is it's quite good practice to write the alphabet down and pick some number, um, typically between 0 and 25 or you know, 1 and 26. And the idea is this. You, you have the alphabet and you have some message. You have some message. Just say hello for the message. And what you would do is you would pick a number let's say five and you would map the words or each letter in the word to another point in the alphabet so here we've selected h which will be the first letter which is obviously here in the alphabet uh, where is h do i write it down no h oh it's there does my k look like a h um and what you would do is you would say i'm going to go and convert this to the letter that's five across so you just step across five you go one two three four five and then you write down m and you do the same for e you say well e is there one two three four five so it's j and l is here so it's one two three four five and again if i picked l you would have one two three four five was it q oh, was it m l one two three four five q again and then o finally we have one two three four five and we have t so what we did is we took the alphabet wrote it down obviously we had a word and then we moved across five characters for each character in our word hello and it mapped to this word here which is gibberish obviously but what's interesting is that it's very easy to undo what we just did. So if you take the output, which is, call it the cipher text here, and you take M, and you go left 5 instead. So you start at M, and you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And you get H. And then for J, you undo it again. You go 1, two three four five left and you get e and then you do q and from q if we move left five we get one two three four five and we get l and i'll fill in the rest of the message because there's no point in me doing that over and over again so this idea of having some input value hello and converting it to some gibberish m j q q t is kind of what encryption is in fact this is called the caesar cipher and this is called the caesar cipher because this is how julius caesar originally started encoding his messages when he was sending them to his generals overseas now obviously this is a very easy cipher to break for many reasons least of all you can just try every combination from 0 to 25 or 1 to 26 in in each direction and eventually you'll have sensible words coming back out again and you'll be able to recognize them as actual decrypted text or you could do frequency analysis so what's really interesting about this encoding especially with this hell is that you will notice that l has encoded to the same letter q and q again and these are weaknesses of these type of algorithms 
but this is the broad idea now now this is sort of the idea of encryption and decryption in general it's far more sophisticated than this but today we're talking about symmetric encryption so you will always start with some input which will be your message say a word document and this input is called your clear text because it's in the clear and you will have some function in the middle which was moving left or right previously in our previous example let's just call it uh, e for encryption this would take this data on the left and using a key which was the number five from our previous example k would take this as an input as well and it would output some other gibberish on the right hand side and this would be called ciphertext and what's interesting about this is that when you want to do the opposite or undo this ciphertext because there's not much use you encrypting input or your clear text data and getting gibberish out if you can't then hand your message to someone else and they take this same key and go in the reverse direction so they should also be able to have this secondary function applied to it using this key again so that you have the input of the key from this ciphertext and then you get back out the clear text and the important thing to realize is that you to go forwards to from the clear text to the ciphertext and to go backwards from the ciphertext to the clear text is always a operation you can undo it's not like hashing as we've previously said you can go in both directions but the important point is is that in both of these cases you need this key here now in symmetric encryption or symmetric cryptography the key is the same in the forward direction or to encrypt the message as it is in the reverse direction to decrypt the message there's only one key this is exactly like when you have a zip file and you put in a password or when you have a wi-fi pre-shared key and everyone types in the same shared key that is symmetric encryption you're using that data to encrypt stuff and it is always the same key that is the input now that key can change forms and be derived into different things but the important thing is is that linchpin is always that same key and that's where the symmetric comes from because you have the sy symmetry from the input clear text to the output cipher text that is always the same in both directions is so everyone okay with that yeah any questions this should be pretty noddy stuff for you guys because you've been doing it for a long time mac how come you said before as well when you you said um about sort of like why did you think symmetric stuff wasn't used as much because it's not as secure it's actually more secure so how more secure if one end's compromised the other end is as well well because you can have perfect forward secrecy with this you can just re-encrypt it again that i guess the important thing is to say that the key length with symmetric encryption which i mean it's a bit of a sort of advanced topic but the key length for symmetric encryption can be much lower than asymmetric encryption so if you turn around and say a 256 bit aes key is as strong or stronger than a 2048 or a 4096 rsa key in fact elliptic curve crypt no actually that's not wrong so elliptic curve is different so that is asymmetric but the key lengths for symmetric stuff are a lot lower than they need to be for asymmetric encryption so easier to root even though ridiculous numbers anyway well there's more weaknesses with i don't want to say it but it's like asymmetric stuff i guess in a sense is more weak because you can break larger keys easier i wouldn't say that brute forcing was necessarily easier because the key lengths are really big but the mathematics of using them makes it sort of simpler in a way to be able to break them there's kind of like more weaknesses in them sort of fundamentally 
And they're also, when people also talk about quantum computers, they are largely referring to breaking asymmetric encryption, not symmetric encryption. So there are some speed up gains to be had, especially for key lengths, I would say under 200 bits, such as AS128. But it doesn't really affect key lengths of things like AES-256, like quantum cryptography can make the brute forcing faster, but it has the problem that an AES-256 bit key gets dropped down to a 128 bit key. Whereas if you had a 496 bit key with RSA, you would essentially be reducing that down to 15 bits of entropy. So like in that sense as well, they're, they're more resistant. They're also quicker. Now, in fact, the, the one thing is, is that they're, always, they're much quicker and that's what's sort of important about them. And that's why they're used for so the 99 to, you know, 99 to 99.9% .9 of all communications. They're much quicker, much stronger, or sorry, they have provide more security for the shorter bit lengths keys. So you were discussing that there is a potential that this will get cracked eventually with like supercomputers and fucking AI. Is well, that still true or? Well, AI, AI doesn't really do that. So quantum computers could break. Uh, I, I would say that like as, as computing power speeds up, symmetric encryption will obviously be more susceptible because breaking the Enigma code 60 or you know, 60, 70, 80 years ago was much more difficult than just doing it on your mobile phone now just because computers have become much faster. So there, there is sort of a, I, I guess, a problem in that as normal computers become faster, but when it comes to symmetric encryption, because asymmetric encryption, sorry, uses what are called trapdoor functions and uses mathematical techniques to sort of enhance this or provide this public-private key pairing, the problem you have is that those mathematical techniques are weak to quantum computers or quantum algorithms. And that's your problem. And you don't have that with symmetric encryption because symmetric encryption isn't typically relying on mathematical stuff. It Well, it does rely on mathematical stuff, but it will do things like this. So, for instance, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say this is exactly how AES works, but it's kind of broadly how algorithms sort of or it's some techniques that algorithms use. So if you had a let's say a piece of data, let's just say one zero one one zero one 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 zero. That is I don't even know how many bits that is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, that's perfect actually. What you can do is Actually, that's probably not a good idea. I'm going to do with actual numbers. That's probably a better idea. But do with actual numbers, it would make more sense. So if I say, uh, uh, let's do with hex uh, zero one seven a e nine f one two three four five six seven. Let's say four two. So this is some message that someone wants to submit or wants to send encrypted, at least symmetrically encrypted. Now, you can do what I said before, and you can use something like the Caesar cipher, but it would obviously be very, very, very weak. However, modern-day algorithms, and particularly AES, work a bit differently. So they will do things like this. They will arrange these letters in a grid. And there's nine letters here, so I'm going to arrange it in a nine-by-nine nine grid. So our first letter is zero, then one then 7, then A, then E, then 9, then F, and then 4, and then 2. So this is our, this is our grid of clear text. This is still in the clear. We haven't converted yet. Now, one of the first things that typically happens is you have this, what's called an S box or a substitution box, and it is a table. It's a lookup table that will have a bunch of numbers in it, and letters or whatever your data is and it will map these letters to some other letter so it would be something like e or it'd be seven two one etc the important thing is is that each one of these these input data on the right has some output date sorry input data on the left has some output data on the right and this is called an s box or a substitution box um, typically they're 
generated through finite field theories and Galois theory, which I don't really want to go into because that's really, really hard. But you will first do something like this. So what you will do is you will take your grid again. Let me just draw the grid. Nine by nine grid. And you will look at the first the first character here or the first piece of data or the first byte number and you will see that zero maps to e so you will put e in this box over here and then you will see that one maps to seven so one maps to seven you put seven in here and then obviously i've not written it down for seven but i'm just going to fill in this box a might be b e might be one so you know e can't be one can it because it's already got a uh, a will be where does a go Oh no, A, a maps one. to 1. Yep, sorry. Yep, my bad. A is 1. So A would map to 1. Then e, can be B. e can be B. 9, I haven't used 9, so 9 can be... F. F can be 9. F can be 9, that's fine. Four F can, can be, seven. be 9, 4 can be 7. No, we've already got two. 7. 4 can't be 7, 4 is 2. Ah. And 2 eight. can be... Let's just say... Eight. No, it's eight gonna, is the one you've not used yet. going to pick 8. There you go, that's fine. That'll work. So we go through this process where we, we, we do these lookups in these tables on the left-hand side here in this S box, and we just convert this data over. Now, obviously, on its own, this isn't very secure because you could just look up. You could just undo this really easy, right? You, you look at what the algorithm says here, and you just convert these bits of data back. But this is an important step in the sort of initial parts of encryption because what you have is with in the English language, I'm gonna use the English language because it's the only language I speak and I know about it more, is you will have a, so does anyone know where histogram is? Incidence of words in the language. That is what I'm gonna draw, or oh, letters, but. So the histogram is the count of how frequent letters and numbers appear. So yeah. looking for stuff like, E, I's, or T-O's together, yeah, like patterns yeah. of letters. Yeah, frequency analysis. Yeah, so, so kind of what you want to do is when you're first sort of doing something like this and doing this mapping, is that you'll, you'll tend to find that things like E are the most common letter in the alphabet, and they will group around sort of particular areas. And what things like S-boxes allow you to do is that obviously, you even though you're sort of like grouping, even though you're doing like a straight conversion of the letter, you're at least in some respect changing the frequency to be something else. Um, and it, it obviously on its own, it's very, very, very weak, but you kind of have a bit of a better distribution for encoding data in the future for the next steps. Yeah, but at the same time, you could use that you could yeah you could yeah you could but as i said this isn't secure on its own it's when you have the extra steps it makes it a bit easier to work with or it makes it more secure to work with 100%. yeah so what i'm going to do is i'm going to delete this original sort of box here and i'm going to draw another grid a bit white this time another nine by nine grid but this time what I'm going to do is I'm just going to like swap the columns. So I'm going to make all the columns move right one. So E, so let, this would now go to four. So this would go to the beginning. So this would be four, F, eight. Then it would go E, B, two. And then it would say, is that right? E, B, oh, I think I messed that up. No, it should be E, one, nine. It should That's be E, one, E, one, nine. I was looking in the middle. And then this will be 7B2. So that's the next step. You would do something like this. You would, you would sort of start mixing the rows and the columns. And then what you would do is you would draw another grid. And you would maybe swap the diagonals. So all of the letters here would move down to this row. And obviously they would have to wrap around. And then this row. So... Or they might swap back and forth. So you might actually, it's probably a bit better if I do it a bit of a different way. So if I take this middle row, oops, if I take this middle row and move it left, 
and then take that mo and move it right. I'm essentially inverting it. So I would have four down here, then two up here, then E here, then B would be here. Seven wouldn't actually swap, thinking about it. We can do it in either direction. Uh, eight wouldn't swap. So I said four and then one would be in the middle. And then you would have nine and F. And each time you're kind of like mixing these different things in. You could push your middle diagonal one as well. No, I that. could, I could, but I, I would, I wanted to like move one that way and then re-swap it, so it would have actually had, it would have literally just flipped the, the, the sort of, it would have flipped the matrix on its diagonal. So it was a bit of a pointless sort of gambit by me. Um, but that's, and you would, you would do, you would do these processes lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of times, and then at certain points when you're doing it, you would start mixing in the key. So you would have some k value, which I said in the last in the last exercise or the last example was five but this is this obviously isn't going to be the key the key is going to be some extremely long uh just delete this it's going to be some extremely long bit of data this is like two four six this is now a six bit key but if we say two if we say 256 this would be a very 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 long bit of key so we'd have we would just randomly pick these ones and zeros, and at certain points in this, we would then take say this number two, and we would add it to this key or portions of this key or key derivations, and then we would take b and we would that this is when we start getting completely different numbers, and we do this process over and over and over again. But the re the really important point is here is that I want to say is we're not using any special mathematics really. We're just substituting some data. We're mixing in some key, and we're swapping around rows and columns. We're not. That will make this susceptible then to supercomputers, I guess. Yeah. No, this this isn't susceptible to supercomputers because it doesn't use any of those mathematical trickeries. It does a lot of swapping. It does a lot of key derivation. It does a lot of like bit flipping and stuff. But it doesn't use any sort of fundamental principles of clever mathematics to sort of encrypt or decrypt data. And the important thing is here at both ends. Is what I said about is what I said about encryption, or at least symmetric encryption, is that everything you do in that direction, which is the S box substitution, the mixing rows, the mixing columns, the key derivation, adding in key, you can also subtract that key. So you have your input or your ciphertext and you have your output. But if you had that key, that original key, right? It's very e you know, it's it's trivial to actually go in the reverse direction. So if you were on the other side of the world and you wanted to encrypt some data, you would both need this key. Doesn't use any mathematical trickery, doesn't use uh, discrete logarithms, doesn't use elliptic curves. That is not symmetric. Symmetric is you use the same key. And algorithms such as AES, AES is the most prevalent one, do this. AES is kind of important as well. So actually, I'll, I'll stop there. Does anyone have any questions about that? No questions. Uh, it seems to be fairly straightforward, even though it looked confusing at the start. You're just moving places. Yeah, you're literally. Yeah, you're literally doing that. Yeah, you just. The important bit is, is you are moving stuff around and you're doing a bunch of substitution, but you're also adding that key in, that randomly generated key that you have. Cool. So, but can can this still be brute force though? Yeah, it can be brute force. Like, oh, every key can be brute brute force, right? Yeah. Everything has a key space. If you yeah. try every value in that key space, you're going to get the correct answer. Yeah, it just will take two billion times long, longer than the entire length of the universe to do it. So, what is the? At what point is an encryption algorithm class unsecure when we know how to break it, but it will take a thousand years? So, yeah, that would be that would be considered broken, one hundred percent. So, where? Where is the timeline? Because there's things that we know how to break that would take longer than we have available to break them. Therefore, it's secure. So it's normally, at least what I've seen in the past, is it comes down to finding some underlying weakness in the algorithm. So thing I don't want to say web. So it's like RC4 in web, in you know wireless encryption, privacy or whatever it's called, the the original sort of like Wi-Fi encryption. This suffered from initialization vector. Yeah, that yeah. was supposed to be like a wired. Uh, I think it's. I think it was supposed. To, anyway, yeah, go on. 
the standard wasn't designed that poorly. Wasn't it like wired equivalent privacy or something? It was like to say yeah, it's that's just exactly yeah. yeah, that's what it is, Joe. Yep. To say that it's equivalent of like having a wire. And, that, and the problem with is, I don't, I don't really, I don't really want to go into sort of initialization vectors just yet. But the 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 sort of thing that was like really difficult about this is is there was fundamental. I don't want to say there was fundamental flaws, but there was fundamental flaws in the way things like RC four were implemented. So RC four is what's called a stream cipher. I will explain this. Yeah. Yeah, but I will explain this in a second. The stream cipher. But what I've seen is that if you can if you can essentially reduce the key size from let's say 128 bit AES key, and you're able to reduce the complexity of the size by 28 bits to 100 bits, then even if a 100 bit key will take 20,000 years to break we will consider it broken. Because even though it might take 20,000 years with our current processing ability, if we used, if someone found a way to use all the supercomputers in the world, then that's significantly reducing it. And then as power of computers increases, it's going to sort of last a bit longer. Because you can even imagine if you had like government secrets and they wanted to keep them top secret for 500 years, you can't, you can't have guarantees about what computing power is going to be around in 500 years and all of these things are going to be stored on disk so you need to make sure that and not even just on disk you can imagine that if you're if a government is sending some data across a wire that someone will have intercepted it even though it's encrypted and even in 500 years there might be some secrets that they don't or governments and people don't want to sort of be exposed because the computing power is caught up with the sort of state of the algorithm. So I wouldn't necessarily say it was in terms of years. That would be quite difficult to sort of say. I would say it's more in terms of the key length. And if you can reduce the key length down to 100 bits, I would say people would consider it insecure. In fact, I would say people start getting a bit tetchy when it starts dropping below 128. Because 128 is kind of like the minimum standard that we want. Now, the sort of one that we used in the 1990s was DES, and DES uses 56-bit keys. So that was a 56-bit key, so that was broken by 44 bits, I, I would say. And obviously, we broke it, we brute-forced it, and we found ways to do it. And I think RC4, I think you could drop it down to 40 bits, or, or maybe even less of sort of entropy. So that was yes, considered. Sorry, hmm? Wasn't that the one the US government recommended everyone use? That was DES. Yeah, and then I think they try to extend it by doing double des, and then that got broken. And then triple des is quite triple des is quite good. I mean, like it's just really yeah, slow, that's right? Good, yeah, good. It's just really slow. So you you can also optimize these algorithms to work in certain sort of areas. So the the, the one sort of really good thing about AES is it kind of works really well everywhere. So if you've got a credit card, you have your credit card. People sort of don't really realize this, but in your credit card, you have it kind of looks like this. You've got this like chip on the front of your credit card. These are these are literal terminals for circuits. So you'll have like an input, you'll have an output, and you'll have like a power. And you, I, I don't exactly remember where they are, but in here, underneath, will will be a computer, and this computer will have a processor. It will have some RAM in it. It will have some sort of like persistent storage over here, maybe. It will also have crypto co processors. So one of these processors here will be a bit of or an ASIC or a bit of hardware that's been optimized to do AES encryption. And AES, the algorithm actually works quite well at this sort of hardware level. The annoying thing about DES and especially triple DES is that even though you could consider it pretty secure, or well, maybe not as secure as AES, but it is relatively secure, mm -hmm. it's really slow. So you can imagine that when you, you know, when you go and put in your credit card into the ATM or whatever and you want to get some money out. It takes five seconds just to do the encryption algorithm. Like that would be yeah, really. AES is pretty fast, right? Yeah, AES is pretty fast. It'd be really, really annoying to be able to do this, um, just to be able to sort of communicate. Chris, some manuals are basically suggesting that, like, you have SHA one, let's say, uh, hashes, and they're so quick, but that's basically a flaw that you can actually brute force them quicker. So hashes, some of the manuals. Hashes on encryption. Hashes yeah, hashes are different, is that correct? Yeah, they're different. I did a video on that last night, so I did a whole oh, thing. Oh, yeah. So they basically were suggesting that you swap to something, let's say Bcrypt, that's a lot slower, and it's like you can throw, you can have a lot less attempts per minute or like per second at brute forcing it, making it a bit more secure compared to 
the same md5 or shower. yeah i mean that is correct with hashes but this isn't hashing this is encryption oh, they are different things yeah. completely different things um so, so this is the thing. She, she, you can optimize his algorithms for sort of different purposes, and we know that AES is is pretty good. It's been around for quite a long time. I, they were originally called different things, and then I th was it NIST or was it the NSA? I can't remember who it was. Yeah, I think it was NIST. NIST, NIST ran a competition, and the competition was called the Advanced Encryption Standard, and the algorithm that won is the one that did this. I can't remember what the original name for it was, and we we deemed it AES. Um, yeah, I forget the mathematicians who were behind it, but yeah, you're pretty much right. I think it was NIST, though. Yeah, I, th yeah, I think it was a NIST competition. But this is kind of the the beauty of it is that, you, like I said, you can optimize these algorithms for working in different environments, which is really, really, really good, and make certain things like really easy. And that's why we really like symmetric encryption because the keys are much smaller, and the algorithms are very fast, like very, very extremely fast. So that's your sort of question about symmetric encryption being used, Machiavelli. It's used everywhere, like it's used for everything. And he goes silent. Fine. I'm trying to think what else I was going to say about AES. I guess the sort of last thing to say about it. Actually, no. Let's talk about block. Let's talk about block verse stream ciphers. So yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that. That's good that you're going to cover that. Yeah, because yeah. I really don't know much about this. So you can imagine, so let's say, I, I can't remember the block sizes of AES and stuff, but let's say AES has got a block size of, I don't know, 16, 16 bytes. This means that AES can only encrypt or decrypt 16 bytes at a time. Yeah, I think they're 128 blocks is what it's it, it could It could be 128 bytes, but I can't, I can't remember the life of me, so I'm just going to write 16 because it makes it easier to draw. Yeah, that's fine. So you have the word hello and this is five bytes well aes can only encrypt 16 bytes at a time so what you would have to do is you'd essentially just have to pad out oh. the rest of the bytes to get it up to that 16 bytes to be able to then put this through the aes algorithm and do the encryption and do the decryption if it's if it's exactly 16 bytes it doesn't really matter you don't need to pad anything if you have more than 16 bytes, you have a really long message. Then what you do is that's your first block is you then take a second block and you encrypt the first one, then you encrypt the second block with the algorithm. So this is what's meant by a block cipher. The, okay, other, the, the sort of other side of it, the other one is sort of a stream cipher. So oh, I'm gonna use RC4 because we spoke about that. RC4 is a stream cipher. Still asymmetric. Remember, it's about the key. As as the asymmetric or the symmetric side means that this key is the same for encryption and decryption. It doesn't matter which way or what type, whether or not you use a stream cipher or use a block cipher to do it. You use the same key for encryption and decryption. However, the difference between a block cipher and a stream cipher is you don't actually need to have a block, a full block, or you don't need to pad out a block to make it work. What you do with RC4 is you kind of initialize it. So you have this, you have like a key and you have an initialization vector. And I won't explain what that is. It's a bit sort of a bit too technical for this talk. That you have some sort of like initial data and you pump in the key at the start. And this thing here just sits in a loop. It, you, it originates from this and it just sits in a loop. And what this will do is it will randomly generate, or, or not randomly generate, it will generate ones and zeros based on the key. So if I turn around and I say, okay, well, I have one byte of data I want to encrypt. It's a zero. Or you know, let's say, this is probably not even better doing that. Let's say I've got one byte of data I want to encrypt. And I say, I want to encrypt hexadecimal A. This will pump out seven. And what I might do is I will X all these two values together. And I don't know what AX or with seven is. I don't know if anyone can calculate that for me. Um, I might actually just go get a calculator just to sort of do this for reals. Let's do this. Uh, I wonder if I could have done, I should have done this in Python, shouldn't I? I'm looking like a right noob now. 
I'm gonna do it with a calculator. Get uh, good, nerd. Yeah, get good. Let me just switch my screen. So if I go to my screen and I do something like Python. And I say, was it 0xA? What did I actually with it? Uh, 7, 0x7. The result is 13. Actually, that's not even hex, is it? Uh, it's going to be annoying. So the result is 0xD. So we know that this 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 A here, XORD with 0x7, is going to result in 0xD. So this is this is the new ciphertext. However, the next time we ask for a bit of information from it, so our next character might be 3. And what I do is I say, oh, I need, I need another piece of data. I need another byte from here. And it might say, okay, uh, let's give it, nine so it gives me nine i x all these things two things together and again this is why i need one of those quick switch things chris what is xor i'm sorry for the dumb question is that where you're comparing or you're comparing no i will i will explain that to you okay. in a second sorry. so what i'm going to do this time is we have the value on the left that we wanted to encrypt which was three and the value on the right was nine so the result is a so our result is A. So this will equal A. 0x A. So our ciphertext for these sort of two bytes of information is DA. But the important thing here is that we're not we don't need it to be in blocks. We're just saying every time I ask you, give me a new byte of information. And this is a symmetric encryption because when I need to decrypt this information here on the right. Uh is that right? Oh god, I need to get my key back, don't I? I shouldn't have deleted that. Let me keep that. When I, so this is my key, 0 and 9, fine. When I get this information on the right-hand side, I basically configure this algorithm the same way. So if I'm decrypting the traffic now, this traffic's coming to me over here, I'm receiving it, and I also know what the original key is. So I set my internal key or my internal loop and s assign it to this this bit, this uh, key here, this um, bit string, and then I take zero x d, and I XOR it with seven, and out pops zero x a, and then I do actually no, that's not right, isn't it? It was zero x, so zero x a, yeah, it was zero x a, yeah, and then I do the same here, and I take zero x nine XOR with uh, nine, and I should get zero x three back out. The important thing is, is that this key here is the same that I use for encryption and decryption. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Does it make sense, the difference between block ciphers and stream ciphers? So stream ciphers are good for, for data in transit, I would imagine, right? They are. So, yeah, they would be good for data in transit. The other okay. thing you can do is, is because as, as long as you aren't that constrained with the data, you, you could... If you were saying, like, like data is is discrete when we send it, like when you send a packet of information, IP version four, you already you kind of already have that data pre-generated, so you you can just use AES for it. You just apply blocks to it, and then if if the data doesn't go all the way to the end, you just put some padding bytes in. So you can use that for data and transit as well. It kind of isn't doesn't really matter that much, but. It, I, I guess sort of where it originally came from is that you could use the different properties of stream ciphers and block ciphers for your particular application. So as you said, data in transit for stream ciphers should be more efficient and quicker in some sort of way. But block ciphers would be more for data at rest. But okay. we typically but we typically can just use AES anyway because it, it's really not that expensive to be able to just wait for block to occur or just pad out that block with some information before we do the encryption of the key with encryption with the keys to be able to transfer the information makes sense mm -hmm. you're interested in knowing what xor was i was yeah i didn't want to stray away from what you were teaching us but i just you know that's probably maybe a yeah, topic for a different time but do you know what ands and or gates and stuff are I'm kind of somewhat, somewhat familiar with it, but yeah, I mean, I, I would say that I'm probably not. But what I'm going to do is... is I'll show you a presentation that I did. Did you uh, record that the other day? No, I didn't record it, but I'm going to just go through the start bit of it. 
because that was just about the gates. Oh god, I can't even switch that. Uh, cool. So do you know what this is? Uh, no. This is a transistor. To, oh, yeah, yeah, I see the pins. So it's okay. te technically a MOSFET, so it's a metal oxide uh, field effect transistor. Sounds really clever, right? The only thing you need to know about it is it's a component in a circuit that you can plug in that you can hook up to wires like this, right? And you can attach a battery or a power source and you have like a positive and a negative end. However, current doesn't flow through this at the moment because it's currently in its off state. So this third pin on the left is for a switch. So you have a switch, right? Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about the switch is, is if you flick the switch, then power starts flowing. And that is what a transistor does. It is a tri-resistor. It, it, it has this power flow and it can resist on the third pin and say, now let power flow through it or let current flow through it. And when it switches off, stop the current. The, the, really, cool th the really cool thing about these here is you can actually arrange them in these configurations. So what you can see is that we, we still have this input here to this transistor, but we've also got this output. So this is exactly everything here is like the previous slide. And everything on the right-hand side is like the previous slide, right? Yeah. What's, what's interesting here is the output here is linked to the input on the one on the right-hand side. Oh, okay. So if we did something like this, we, we flipped this switch, well, power doesn't flow, right? Because right. It's, like, it's like a pump. Mm -hmm. you, you can't... If you block off one end of the pipe you still can't have water go through it because we're, this here is still in a blocked state, it's still in an off state. What happens if you turn this switch on and this switch on, then power can now switch and it can flow through, right? Make sense? Yeah, it does. Well, this is called an AND gate. This is literally what an AND gate is. And this is how AND gates are built in processors with these two transistor gates. And the idea is oh. it, it works like this. You have an AND and it says switch one and switch two must be on for power to flow through it. Make sense? Uh, make, yeah, that makes sense. You can actually represent this using bits of information as well. So we can have, we, we, instead of having switches, we can just represent it as ones and zeros. So we will do what's called a truth table. You've never seen a truth table before. No, I don't think I've heard of it. Either. That's fine. And we remember, we have two switches. We have, I'm going to draw them in different colors. So I have switch number one. And switch number two. Yeah? Yeah. And we will have one and two. Yeah, this is going to be the result. So switch one, we're going to say zero can be off or it can be on. Or it can be off and it can be on. And I've done it four times and I'll show you why. So what we can do on the right hand side is we can say, well, switch two can also be off. But it can, and then, but switch two, so switch one and two can be off, right? Mm -hmm. But we can also have, in this first example, we had the example where it was switch one was on, but switch two is also off, yeah? Mm -hmm. We also have, a, we have the case where you can have switch one is turned off, but switch two is turned on, yeah? Yeah. Or we can have it where we have switch one and switch two turned on. And you can actually write the results for this. So if you have switch one and switch two off, then the result is zero. Hmm. When you have switch one turned on and switch two turned off, because this is an AND gate, it's zero. Yeah. If you have switch one turned off and switch two turned off on, sorry, you still have zero. The only configuration where you get one out at the end is when switch one and switch two are turned on, and you get a one. This is this is this is power is now flowing flowing through the circuit. Makes sense. It does, yeah. So you're probably gonna laugh, but I, I play this game from time to time. It's a uh, Minecraft does something similar with redstone when you make circuits. It's actually a, uh, it's actually kind of similar uh, where you're doing switches and making gates like that. So I guess it's still the same concept in in binary. Um, it sounds like that's the same thing. I th yeah, so it, it is. It is. So yeah, that's that's using uh, it's called bit level. I guess bit level or transistor level logic. It's it's the fundamentals of digital electronics using redstone in. Minecraft is exactly the same. Freddy, can you turn your mic off or something? You're just making loads of noise. Freddy, is that Freddy? Yeah, okay. Yeah so. yeah, so, okay, that makes sense, yeah. So is that using Boolean logic, or is that completely yep. different? this is Boolean logic. Okay. Cool. So the, the other type of gate you can have, or there's a couple, um, 
is this one. So instead of having the output go to the input of the one on the right hand side, you can have the output that's just linked to this wire here. So what you can do is if you have this switch turned on on the left, then power will just flow through because it can freely flow to the end and you get this one. You can also have this other case where this one on the left is switched off and the one on the one switched on on the right is on. And power will still flow. So you can either have switch A turned on and power will flow, or you can have switch B turned on or switch 2 and power will flow. And this is called an OR gate, right? Oh shit, I, I just forgot, I didn't realise. Why did no one show, tell me? Why did no one tell me? Let me go through that again. I was just listening. Sorry, no, it's fine. I, I, it makes sense. No one tells me that they're not displaying stuff because I didn't switch it. Right. Let's go through that again. My bad. So this is this is the other configuration, right? So you have two switches and you have two transistors. Mm -hmm. And on the left-hand side, this is like the previous configuration. You have an input and it goes to this wire in the output. But the difference here is that the input on this side isn't from this switch on the left-hand side. And you have this case where you can turn switch number one on and power will flow because there's nothing impeding it or stopping it. Or you can have switch one off and switch two turned on and power will flow in this direction. And the important thing to realize is here that you can have switch one on and power will flow or you can have switch two on and power will flow. Does that make more sense? Okay. Yeah, that does. Cool. So that's an OR gate, right? Because it's it's not you need one and two switched on. You can have one or two switched on. And the truth table for that would look different. So you would still have these configurations on the front, but the output would be different. I, might, I should actually use the proper symbols, really. So I'm going to say switch one or switch two. So if we have this case where switch zero, or sorry, switch one, and switch two is off, then we don't actually get any power flowing through, so this has to be equal to zero. Mm -hmm. In this one here, switch one is on, and we do get power, because switch one or two could be switched on. This one, we have switch one on, or switch two, so that power flows. And in the final one, it doesn't really matter, right, because you can have either of them on, and it will still flow through. Make sense? Yeah. So this is an OR gate. If I switch back. So there was a final gate to tell you about. This has got one switch that's important. And what's important to realize here is that you have some kind of resistor in the middle. But the important bit is, is that any information or recording of any values will be on this lower um, piece of the circuit here. So by default, if power comes in here and goes through this resistor, this will actually. This is the default state. Power will flow through it. There's nothing stopping it. Obviously, there's a bit of resistance in the resistor, but it can't flow up and through this transistor because it's currently turned off. Which means when the switch is off, power is flowing through the circuit. However, you can actually switch this switch on, and a bit like water, as it will go through the path of least resistance, it will actually stop going through, or less power or less voltage would flow through the circuit at the bottom. And instead, it would flow through the circuit at the top. So it, when you have this switch on, it turns off the value at the bottom. And this is called the NOT gate. And the, the idea is this. Whenever the NOT gate is on, power flows. Sorry, whenever the NOT gate is off, power flows. Mm -hmm. If you turn switch one on, power would stop flowing. And this is a NOT gate. So this is, again, has this different configuration. In fact, this is completely different. Yeah. yeah, it's probably better to. I think this whole thing would be way different. Yeah. Yeah, because we've, we've only got one switch. This is going to be our truth table again. Our truth table. And we only have one switch. We just have switch one. And we have some output. This is the output on the left. And what you can have is if switch one is off, then the output is on. But if switch one is on, then the output is zero. And this is called a NOT gate. It literally inverts whatever value is there to the opposite value, just swaps it. Make sense? That's pretty cool. Yeah, it does. Cool, let me just switch back quickly and almost at the end of this. So you have an AND gate where you have 
A or A and B must be on, an OR gate where A or B must be on, and a NOT gate where that just inverts the data. Mm -hmm. The important, th the very important thing to realize about this is that you can you can combine these gates. So this gate here says if A and B is on, then it will set the output to be one. But then you have this NOT gate, so it says this one is going to be swapped from a one to a zero. So this entire thing will be zero only if A and B is on. Oh, I can see where this gets, it can get complicated. Yeah, that's pretty cool. This is this is literally how processors work. This is what's in them. It's just lots of these transistors. So you can imagine, if we can actually do two truth tables now, we can say we want to have an AND gate. So the symbol for AND is this. And I'm going to draw the symbol for NOT like this. Is it that way? I think it's that way. Um, so we're going to have our AND gate, our AND gate on the right. And we have two switches. We have switch A and switch B, and we have some output. So this will be A and B. So this will be our output. And we can have these combinations. We can have A can be on, off, on, off, and B can be off, off, on, on. And the only time you would ever have A1 in this circuit is 0, 0, 1, 0. And then we also have a NOT gate. So we have a NOT gate on the right-hand side. So we have a NOT gate here. And this just does the opposite. So we have A. If A is on, or the output of this is on, mm -hmm. let's say if it's off, then the output's on. If it's on, then the output's off. So this will just be that NOT symbol that we have, NOT A. Oh, okay. And what we do is we can actually map the outputs. So the only time that this circuit here is on is here yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah so this means this will add these two gates together and we will get zero. Oh, okay so what you would do is sort of logically you would draw this as a not actually let me just delete that i need to make a bit more space so you draw this as a and b put some brackets around it you draw this not in front of it and not just that oh. you also put an n in front of here so it's a nand gate and what this would do is because it has this inverting effect because we've got this not gate on it it would change all of these values so it would say when this is off this would be one when this is off this would be on and this would be zero and this would be on so it would invert the output of the gate but well, we could only do that because we could combine them. That makes sense. It does, yeah. So there's there's another thing to say with OR, and this is the really important thing bit about XOR. So in the English language, there's not really a very good way to describe OR. You could say, I would like salt or vinegar on my crisps, or salt or vinegar on my chips, right? Mm -hmm. But you can have salt and vinegar on your chips, yeah? Yeah. So that's called just a normal OR. Or an inexclusive or because having one doesn't stop you doing the other right yeah but if you're going on holiday and you say i could go to mexico or i could go to spain for my holiday you can't do both of those things at the same time because if you went to spain you can't go to mexico and if you went to mexico you couldn't go to spain so that's called an exclusive or so if i if i if we should really <laughs> to make it very very clear we could have an i or which would be an inclusive or this is the, the, the salt and vinegar on your chips. And we could have a X or, which is I can either go to Spain or I can go to Mexico. Oh, okay. So the truth tables for these, you would still have the same switches. You would have A, B, A, B. Remember, the important thing is, is that you can't do both of the things in an X or at the same time. So we have the same configuration. We can have... One zero one zero for switch A, zero zero one one for switch B, and again over here, one zero one zero, zero zero one one on the right. And we can say that much like we had before, salt and vinegar, right? We we can have if A's on, then the entire circuit's on. Mm -hmm. In this configuration, both are off, so it's a zero. If it's on, either one of them's on, it's fine, so that's a one. And if that one's on, it's a one. However, this is this is an inclusive. It means that you can do two things at the same time, 
which is exactly what this, this case here indicates. It means we can do both of these things. But with an XOR, you can't do both of the things at the same time. So what we have in this one here is we have switch number A is on, which means that we have one on the output. In this case, both of them are off. But this is where the exclusivity bit comes in. You can go to Spain or Barcelona. So if you have one and a one, then this is off. Oh, and then in the okay. final bit, you have one. So this is an exclusive or because you can only do one at the same time. Okay. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Cool. So that's an, that's an XOR. And this is sort of the, the, the final bit I want to sort of make out. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you some hex. So if we have a hexadecimal value of A, that will map to 1, 0, 1, 0. And let's say you have a hexadecimal uh, value of nine. This would map to one, zero, zero, one. These are the hex. So this is zero x a, zero x nine, and the below here. This is the binary format of it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So what we do is we can actually arrange these. So we let's say we have some key. Our our key from the bit is four and eight. So our key is zero x four and zero x eight. So the key here is actually one zero zero zero, and this key is zero one zero zero, because this is the binary representation of eight and the binary representation of four, and we do an XOR. So what you do is you have a look at these values. I'm going to use white, and you say, let's do zero XOR zero. Well, the result is zero, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's off and there's none of them are on. Well, in this case, we have 1 is on and 0 is off. That's fine. So that's a 1, obviously. Here again, we have 0 and a 1. So we make this a 1. And in the final one, we have 1 and a 0. So we make this a 1. However, this is a bit different. So this 1 on the right is a bit different. So we have, at least in the end bit, so we have a 1 on. And there's a 0, so there's a 1. Both of these are off, so it's a 0. Both of these are off, so it's a 0. The important thing is here is that we have a 1 and a 1. What will the result be? It'll be 0. It will be 0, right? Because it's a, it's exclusive. It's that, you know, Spain versus going to Mexico thing. Yeah. However, there is a really, really, really important uh, property of this XOR. You can undo it, which is really, 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 really useful. It's very, very easy to undo. So reversible that's what it means it's oh. inferable so if i deleted this data at the top and i didn't know what that data was i can just reapply this result to the key and i will get back out the original answer so zero and zero it's like reverse engineering basics man yeah. this is awesome zero and zero <laughs> is zero right one and a zero here, what you know, one and a zero is one. A one and a one is zero, and a one and a one and a zero is one. So we got the same value back out. A is ten, this is eight, nine, ten. So we got the value back out. And we can do the same here. We can see that one and a zero is a one. Zero. Zero and one. That's nine. This is invertible. This is what's really cool about those stream ciphers, or when I'm saying XOR, it, you can XOR keys in. You can just have this key, and you can apply it, and you can undo it by applying XOR again. That that's makes awesome. sense. That also, yeah, it does. That also explains why they're not exactly... Uh, I guess that's why they would consider those broken at some point in time. I, I wouldn't say this is necessarily broken. This is just a way to mm -hmm. combine key. Like, if this data, if this key here was sufficiently random, it wouldn't be broken. Like, you, you could never figure out what it is, right? In fact, this is... this is. I don't want to... That's kind of not true for me to say this, is how a one-time one -time pad works, but you can kind of combine the keys in the same way. If you have sufficient amount of data... Uh, sorry, you have a sufficient amount of randomness in your data, and your key is really, really good, and you just use, like, the key with your XOR, and sorry, you XOR your key, your, you know, your very good random key, with your, um, uh, with your data, it's, it's literally impossible to decrypt. You can't decrypt it. Even, you can't even brute force it. 
It's impossible. So it's kind of like perfect secrecy. But the problem is, is you need to share that key securely first, right? <laughs> yeah. Because you you can imagine that if I, if if I was sitting over here in you know in in the UK, right, and you were sitting over here in the USA, and we wanted to, I wanted to send you a secure message using symmetric encryption, well, we both need the same key in the middle. So you have some message you want to send to me, but first you need to encrypt it. So fine, you can use your key and you can encrypt it and you get this encrypted message. And you send the key to me, so I get this encrypted message over here. But I can't decrypt it because I don't have access to that key. So you need to deliver this key to me somehow over in the UK. But the problem is, is how do you securely deliver that key to me? You physically have to. Yeah, but that's talk, talking about asymmetric encryption. But just in symmetric encryption, how do you get that key to me? In things in things like Germany, or sort of, I guess, World War Two, what used to happen is you used to have these books, these, like, code books, and just every day would have a new key on it. And that would be your key. And if everyone knew to use the same key on that particular day, then you could decrypt the traffic when it was sent to you. The unless problem somebody steals your book. <laughs> yeah, unless someone steals oh, your book. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. If somebody steals your book and copies it, and you don't know they <laughs> stole your book. You are fucked. <laughs> so there was loads of raids on um, like German U-boats when they were going down. There's like British people. Oh, I don't want to say just British sailors, but, but but you know the Royal Navy or the U.S. Navy would just dive into these submarines, trying to get these code books out, and then sink the submarine as quickly as possible, so they've not had the chance to alert anyone because then the Germans would send at least for a few days until they realised that the submarine was, you know, had, had been sunk and they'd be able to decrypt the messages. And not just for that day, they'd also... So also for the previous day, so this, this code book's going to have all of the... You know, if this is today, it's also going to have the previous days in. So even if they change all the keys in the future and issue new code books, well, it doesn't matter, right? Because we've already collected 20,000 intercepts from three days ago and we can decrypt them and read the messages. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's kind of what I really want to say about symmetric encryption without getting too, too sort of bogged down into the maths and the specifics and things like initialization vectors. Mm -hmm.